I'm Jules and welcome to an episode of One Chapter at a Time. Today we are going to be looking at an iconic watch that is very much of its time. Now for those of us that can, cast your mind back. No, no, back further. The year is 1973. Large parts of the world are in an energy and oil crisis. Watergate was gripping the front pages and our airwaves. Inflation was 8%. Stevie Wonder, The Eagles and Pink Floyd are on the wireless, Skylab is still in the air, and after all the controversy and turmoil, the Sydney Opera House was opened. Gracing our silver screens that year was none other than Roger Moore. The movie Live and Let Die, with one of the best opening Bond songs, James Bond wears a very special wristwatch, the Pulsar P2 2900 LED digital watch. Q clearly outdid himself that day. The Pulsar P2 was as technically advanced as watches could be at the time, even though they are a little light on in features by today's standards. With the push of a button, it displays the time, for a short time. But wait, if you press and hold the button, the seconds are displayed. The P2 was the world's first successful mass-produced digital watch. LED, or light emitting diode, watches were only popular during a brief period in the 1970s and were quickly replaced by the more familiar LCD watches. Bond himself switched to LCD Seiko watches. To be fair, Bond also wears a Rolex Submariner in Live and Let Die. Interestingly, at the time the movie was released, the Pulsar P2 had a price tag about the same as a Rolex Submariner, approximately $390. In today's money, that is $2,266. Notable celebrities who sported a P2 include Jack Nicholson, Peter Sellers, Bill Bixby, Keith Richards, Elton John, Gianni Anginelli. Even boxing great Smoke and Joe Fraser was pictured wearing his showing off in the run-up to his fight with Joe Bugner. The Pulsar P2 was the must-have accessory to show off wealth, influence and style. Pulsar was created and owned by the Hamilton Watch Company in the early 1970s, but in 1978 Seiko bought out the Pulsar name. Although the P2 was a huge success, as with most revolutionary advances, this digital watch was almost a disaster. As I'm sure you guessed, the P2 was the second model produced by Pulsar. The very first digital watch, the Pulsar P1, was introduced in April of 1970. The P1 was a very limited edition model, not much more than a prototype, only 400 were produced. The P1 featured a solid 18 karat gold case, and the crystal was made out of a solid slab of synthetic ruby, costing an astonishing $2,200 back then. I'll let you do the math. However, the real innovation of the P1 was the 25 chip module inside the case. It had 25 individual tiny integrated circuit chips and over 400 gold connections, each of which had to be painstakingly hand soldered. It was rumoured that the module was by far the most expensive part of the watch and that Hamilton Pulsar was building them at a loss even at that astronomical price. It was thought that they would last a hundred years without maintenance, so the cases were soldered permanently shut using gold solder. Unfortunately, the modules started failing within a few months, and Pulsar recalled them all, replacing the overly complex 25 chip modules with a variant of the single chip modules that were made for the P2. The original 25 chip modules were destroyed, and currently, only about six are known to exist today. Despite its elevated price tag, on the 4th of April release, the P1 was a sellout success, with celebrities like Elvis Presley, the Shah of Iran, Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, Sammy Davis Jr. and Yul Brenner. Selassie was so impressed by the P1 that he granted Hamilton a Certificate of Excellence. Davis was so distraught after his P1 was stolen that he had a jeweller in Las Vegas call Hamilton for an immediate replacement. Rumours circulated 
that one of then US President Nixon's daughters popped into Tiffany's to buy P1 as a gift for her father, as you do. Light emitting diodes by Litronics was one of the most expensive components in the Pulsar digital watch. And Pulsar decided to never cut corners and use plastic to enlarge these tiny dot displays. Quality and visibility of the LEDs was vital and thus displays were encapsulated in durable epoxy giving large and easy readouts. The cool dot display was characteristic only for Pulsar watches until 1975 when segment or bar displays became the standard. The time is displayed by pressing the time command button. This contains a small but powerful magnet soldered into a cup inside the case. A push of the time command button illuminates the hours and minutes, while a continued press for precisely 1.25 seconds would reveal running seconds. The reason for having the time displayed only briefly was to conserve the battery. The LEDs are a thirsty lush by comparison to its power sipping reserved LCD cousin. Originally, the Pulsar P2 used the 355 battery. This is no longer manufactured. Luckily though, the 357 or SR44 will happily fit with the use of some plastic spaces. The time was set with a P-shaped magnet, or time set bar, as Pulsar called it. The P2 also came equipped with a time set magnet stored within the bracelet. You imagining yourself as James Bond, simply removed the magnet from within the deployant clasp and placed it into the grooves to cycle the hours and on the second groove to adjust the minutes. So what's better than a Pulsar P2? A second P2! This one was purchased because the electronics were no longer functioning. Obviously the chip had died. At the time of purchase, a different company was offering a replacement, or as I like to call it, reimagined movement. They took the original finely detailed injection molded plastic movement holder, removing all the critical components. They then designed and built a new movement that still utilizes the original LED dot display, the same time set mechanism by means of magnetically controlled reed switches and the battery holders. I see this as a stroke of genius in restorative electronic engineering. The original will always have its pride of place. This though allows a new generation of wearers the joy of experiencing this very finite moment of history, while still being faithful to the spirit of the watchmaking craft, surfing the bleeding edge of technology and cool. I wish I had the foresight to find out who was recreating these movements and ask them a million questions. If anyone knows, please feel free to tell me in the comments. I would love to know their story. As you can see, the P2 is a broad cushion or barrel shape, the majority of which is taken up by this slab of ruby for the time to shine through. But when viewed from underneath, you can see there is a circular screw down case ring for the case back. The case almost acts like a bezel around the red window due to the uniform size of the margin. The only feature interrupting the lines of the case is the time command button. The Pulsar P2 measures 36.5mm across and 45.5mm from top to bottom, including the lugs. Without the lugs, it's only 32.5mm. It's 14mm thick, think about that, almost a centimetre and a half sitting above your wrist, though the weight is a mere 83 grams. So what's it like to wear? My first impression was how light it is. Based on its chunky size, I expected it to have more heft, much like that of a Seiko dive watch or a Rolex. However, it's light and dare I say, practical. The bracelet has many links, which makes it conform to the wrist, though it's not too rattly or jangly. The branded deployment clasp is simply pressed steel. This does feel a little cheap by comparison, but when you are developing the world's most advanced watch, you have to shave the corners somewhere. 
I'm happy to overlook all of this, knowing that I have a little magnet hidden away in the clasp for setting the time. Despite its age, the lines and edges on the bracelet are still crisp. The watch case too has well-defined edges, even if it does have some scratches and lines in the finish, as to be expected with its age. The bracelet does taper from 23mm at the lugs to 15.5mm at the clasp. The bracelet is held to the lugs by means of a screw pin, and this feels like a quality addition. On the wrist, and I'm only a little guy, it sits very nicely. It doesn't rattle around or spin to the back of my wrist. For a thick chunky watch, it's quite comfortable, possibly due to the sloping faces of the case and the low sitting lugs. This could easily be a daily wearer. Why do I like it? I like the Pulsar P2 because it has a bit of a fun story. It comes from a relatively recent history, a time where a lot of energy and intellect was put into innovation. Yes, this came at a cost to the mechanical watch industry. But I think this embodies the spirit of any storied watchmaker you care to mention in their drive for perfection and innovation. At first glance, it is understated, easy to see past, but on appraisal, it draws you in. The quizzical mind can't help but ask questions like, is it new or old? What does it do? How does it work? It still dances a fine line between all these juxtapositions. It is fun to wear, and I find myself using the time command button to briefly display the time for no reason other than the frivolous joy of it all. At the same time, anxiety kicks in, like an electric car owner knowing that each time I press this little button, the batteries are being drained of their potential. As you may know, Hamilton has recently re-released the P2, called the Hamilton PSR. It comes in both brushed stainless steel and a yellow gold PVD case. These are being manufactured to a limited number of 1,970 or 1970, do you see what they did there? The main difference is the engraved Hamilton name. Originally, the case was engraved with Pulsar. The Pulsar name has since been sold to Seiko. As you would expect, with the advancement in technology, the display is no longer an LED. The new display is now a hybrid OLED and LCD. This allows for the constant display of the time, but a press of the button lights up the display in the more familiar dot display. Many watch manufacturers made LED watches back in the day, all in the mad scramble to be inside the technology envelope. Different designs, sizes, case materials. But for me, this is one of the greats. It's not often you get to see a Genesis moment, but in the Pulsar P2, you get to quite literally hold it in the palm of your hand. So tell me, is this a future classic or just tragic? Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. Also hit that bell for notifications for future updates. Thanks for watching. Surfing the bleat Surfing the bleeding edge of technology and cool Unlike me